Morning, folks. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Fredonia First United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Nettie, and this is my pillow. Actually, it's not my pillow. What it is is a reminder. Uh, this is our last week for uh, collection or donating to Sleep in Heavenly Peace. It's that organization that makes beds uh, for children who don't have any. No, what is it? Their expression or their uh, coined phrase. Uh, no child goes without, I think it is, no child goes without a bed. Not just, uh, not only do they make the beds, but they buy bedding to go with the bed so that all kids can be warm and cozy uh, in their own bed. And uh, the other nice part about that is that um, if you uh, would like to participate in what that project looks like and help us build those beds, that'll be coming up this summer and um, I think that's taking place in Clarence, New York, so any of you folks from out that way are more than welcome to join us. Just call the office and say you'd like to participate. The other thing I wanted to mention is if you're not getting our weekly letter, I do send out a weekly letter that has a calendar and everything that's going on. If you call the office at 679-1513, you can sign up for that or, like I said, take a look on our website. We've got a lot of studies going on right now. If you want to participate in any of those. Uh, next month, I believe our project will be UMCOR, you know, those flood buckets that we put together. Well, now we'll be supporting the agency that sends workers all over the world. There's a disaster somewhere, UMCOR is there. But I will talk about that a little bit more next week. So why don't we just take a minute and get rid of the week's clutter? Just kind of exhale a minute. Let's open in prayer. God of all of us, you name us and you claim us according to your purposes. You called Abraham and Sarah a long time ago and you trained them to hear your call. And Lord, we just ask you to tune our hearts into open, you know, into being open to you, to what you have for us, Lord, today. And as we move into reading your word and hearing your word, Lord, we just ask that you would put a blessing on it, that you would move our hearts, Lord, closer to you, closer to one another, Father, as we move and work together in this beautiful kingdom space. And right now, Lord, I just ask you to put a, a blessing on each person present here right now, that their hearts would be open, that they would have the ears to hear what you have to say, and that they would be fully blessed. And now as we move into this time, Lord, we just uh, ask for your peace. Oh, your peace. And uh, we just ask this in Jesus' name. And Nick, we'll have you bring us into that place of peace and worship.
Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. I'd like you to join me for our call to worship. Um, God's voice names us in holy love. Christ's voice chastens us when we go astray, and the Spirit's voice draws us back to the paths of righteousness. Thanks be to God. From generation to generation, God names us and claims us. Blessed be the Lord our God. When we try to tell God what to do, Christ redirects us and leads us back onto the paths of life. Let all who draw breath come back to the Lord. From our earliest steps, the Spirit guides us and sets before us ways of life and death. Let we who are faithful rejoice. Let we who are faithful rejoice in the mysteries of our God. From generation to generation, God names us and he claims us. Let heaven and earth praise God's holy name. And friends, join us now for our opening hymn and our time of prayer and praise. Good morning. Let's join in our time of prayer and praise as day by day he leads us in this Lenten journey.
Yes, Lord, you do. You love us so much. You do love all of us so much, Father, that you came down here to walk among us, to teach us your ways and to show us your love. Father, we just thank you that you did that for us. We thank you for your kingdom, Lord, this invisible kingdom, Lord, that we often gloss over like it doesn't exist, Father, is always present you are always working. You are always loving. You are always moving, Lord, through your people, Lord. Father, I just thank you for the way you do work through each one of us, bringing your kingdom alive here on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, today as we come together, we'd like to lift up some of those saints, Father, that uh, might need an extra blessing. I think about uh, Karen and the Matheson family. I, I think about the Hennessys. I think about the Gambinos. I think about the Murphys. I think about the Motto family. But all these families that might need that extra touch or one of your kingdom people to come and bring them a little bit of light and a little bit of joy. And Lord, we just lift up all those people down south who are experiencing this terrible weather. And we thank you for the people that you've sent. We thank you for your church that's so faithful. Lord, I was thinking about you today and I was thinking, boy, during through this whole pandemic, Lord, your church has just come through taking care of people all around the world. Every corner church, Lord, has been making sure people have food and clothing and warmth, Lord. It's your church, Lord, your people, your kingdom people, Lord, that seem to get us through every hard time, Father. And I just thank you that you've called us. And I thank you for all those who've said yes to being one of your kingdom people, Lord. And Father, we just uh, thank you and praise you that you're here with us today. We thank you for our families. We thank you for the vaccine that's <clears throat> going around, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that more people will get the vaccine and we'll, we won't lose so many, Lord. And we just lift up those families that have lost loved ones, Lord, uh, to COVID and to other sicknesses. We lift up the frontline workers, Father, who've uh, put themselves in a place of really high risk, Father. We just ask you to just put this dome of protection around each one, Lord, and we thank you for those who have taken care of everybody so far, Lord, and we even thank the families for their loved ones who have been frontline workers, Lord, that uh, for their sacrifice, because I know that many have lost their loved ones because they were helping all of us. And Lord, when I say frontline, I mean grocery workers, I mean postal workers, I mean hospital workers, I mean dialysis workers, I mean church workers, I mean all of your kingdom workers, Father, who are out there loving and serving and being your hands and feet. And Father, today I just praise you for each person here. Lord, I just close my eyes and I can picture almost every single one because I've met them all. And I just thank you for each one. I thank you for their hearts. I thank you for their willingness to be here. I thank you because I know that they are some of those folks that are out there helping other people, spreading your joy, spreading your peace, and spreading your good news. Thank you, Father, for each one. I ask your blessing on each one. And now, church family, I ask you, if you have a name on your heart, to lift it up. Now lift yourself up. What is it in your life that's keeping you from having full peace? What is it that's separating you from all the love and all the joy that God has for you? Whatever it is, leave it at the altar. It's time to let go of that burden and let Jesus take it for you and let him fill your heart with all that he has just for you. 
So, Father, today as we move forward in worship, bless the word as we read it. Bless each person here, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for your goodness and for being present and for your kingdom and for every good and perfect thing that comes from above. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, praise team. Every week you make me feel really happy to be in church. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Even the smallest seed, if you have that much faith, you plant that seed of faith into your heart, you could say to this mountain, move, and it'll move. All these kingdom parables that Jesus shared with us, letting us know what the kingdom of God as a whole really is, and that it exists, and what it's like, encouraging all of us to move into that kingdom of mentality to take on that life that he came down to share with us. And during this Lenten season, the Lord has really laid on my heart the importance of on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord has laid on my heart this burden because he wants us to remember that the kingdom of God was central to the ministry of Jesus. It was central to the disciples who laid down their lives to launch this movement into our history. He wants us to remember and to remind us that Jesus came specifically to usher in this kingdom way of hope and love and community for all of humanity. Jesus came and made a way where there was no way to transform our hearts so that we could see the kingdom. Through his work on the cross and his resurrection, he made a way so that we could find our place in this world, find our place in his kingdom work. John 3.3 3 says it this way, Truly I tell you, he tells us this himself, Jesus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And being born again comes through your faith in Jesus Christ believing that he is who he said he is and accepting him as your savior, letting him clean house and clean your heart out, making it anew. That's being born again. Jesus came to invite people into the kingdom way of life and into his kingdom reign. And when hearts are transformed and we walk in the ways of Jesus, then we know that our world can be transformed. But it takes us, friends. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Take up your cross. What does that even mean? What does the kingdom of heaven really look like? Is it even possible for God's ideal life for humanity, humanity to even exist down here on earth? The answer is yes. Not fully, because that won't happen until he returns. But the answer is yes, it can. Yes, it can if we say yes with Jesus. Now we see glimpses of God's kingdom people at work all the time. These little beams of light then come into our places of darkness. I think about uh, even during this pandemic, as I mentioned earlier, all the people that have... Um, moved outside their selves, moved outside their fear to make sure that everybody else has what they need. People who don't 
really have two nickels to rub together, but they're sharing what they do have with others so that everybody else is okay. I think about the people that are down south that don't have, you know, heat, and they're hit with the snow, and other people taking them in. Churches, once again, stepping into those places of love and care and taking care of those who need it. I think about those in Buffalo. I think about City Mission and all those places that take in the homeless and make sure they're okay. And folks like you and me and others, we support those places to make sure that they can stay open. See, that's God's kingdom work. That is on earth as it is in heaven. And that happens through us. God's people here, you and me, representing God's kingdom ways to the world around us. The book of Revelation gives us a little glimpse into the kingdom of God. I believe it's Revelation 21. His word tells us that in, uh, in the eternal and heavenly realm, listen to this, because this is where your loved ones are, right? At some point, though, they're all going to be one. Heaven and earth are going to be one. Right now, there's a little bit of a chasm between us, but that won't always be there. But we can do a little of that kingdom work that exists in heaven and bring it down here to earth. We do have the ability to make that happen. The book of Revelation gives us a glimpse into that kingdom. His word tells us that no sin exists. There's no self-centeredness or pridefulness. And if no evil or sin exists and there's no self-centeredness, then that means there's no hurting. There's no crying. There's no pain. There's no fear. There's no sadness. There's no selfishness. There's no greed, no prejudice, no racial inequality. And if there's no greed, guess what? That would mean there'd be no sickness because we know that greed is usually at the bottom of um, us ruining the earth making decisions to do things to the earth um, that would hurt the earth and hurt others because of greed. So greed, even greed, there's no greed up there. Uh, and we know that self and pride and greed lie beneath all crime, all injustice, and all wars. The heavenly realm doesn't experience any of the hard things that we do down here on earth because, again, there's no sin. All the things I named are sins, things that are sinful. That's why God hates sin so much, because it, sin hurts humanity. There are th things that we do that hurt one another, hurt community, hurt the kingdom. Those are those sinful places in humanity. And when, he, when we hurt, he hurts with us. That's why he hates sin so much. Matthew 12, 35 tells us uh, this. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil or the corrupt person out of his evil and corrupt treasures bring forth evil and corruption. So the kingdom of God as a whole includes heaven and earth. The kingdom of heaven is in the heavenly realm. But right now I think uh, pretty much only heaven's got it fully right. And like I said earlier, our loved ones right now are enjoying light, love, joy, peace, kindness, and are fully present in the company of God and our Lord Jesus every day. But you know, Jesus came to help us bring that heavenly way into our earthly realm. Because where heaven and earth meets, lives truly are changed. You know, in today's reading, we'll see Jesus challenging the disciples. Um, the first of his uh, heaven on earth kingdom keepers. But first, I want to just take a little review of what we looked at last week because it's all taken out of the book of Mark. It's the Gospels or the Good News are all a connected story, remember? It starts with, uh, some books start with his birth or his baptism, and then they go right to his resurrection uh, on the cross. So we were jumping today a little bit from the time he was baptized uh, until the time he's speaking to his disciples now. So let's take a look. Last week when we were together, we took a look at the Gospel of Mark, which means good news. We learned that the long-awaited Messiah had finally arrived. 
We learn that Jesus was the Messiah, the Lamb of God who could take away the sin of the world. We learn that Jesus came specifically to usher in on earth as it is in heaven or the kingdom way. We talked a little bit about John the Baptist being the forerunner. We saw many receive baptism, the baptism of repentance from John so that they could get themselves washed clean and ready for the new way that was coming. We watched as Jesus himself stepped into the water and said yes to God's call on his life. We saw God our Father in heaven acknowledge and affirm Jesus is his son and the Messiah, the Lamb of God. And we saw John the Baptist give a testimony, a witness testimony, acknowledging that Jesus was who he said he was and that, that he was the Son of God. So in between that time and where we are in this reading, there are a few things that took place. Jesus called some of his other disciples. Jesus shared his kingdom parables, you know, the kingdom is like. Jesus performed the four messianic miracles that uh, only the coming Messiah could have performed. We see Jesus feed and heal many. We see Jesus showing people that radical love that he had and what hospitality should really look like among one another. We see Jesus teaching about the kingdom way and calling people to repentance. We see Jesus challenge the legalistic Pharisees. And now we see Jesus with his disciples and for the first time he predicts his death wanting to know or posing the question to this 12, the 12 that have been with him now for about three years, not who do you say that I am? No, he's asking them, do you believe in the gospel and in the kingdom way so much that you are willing, are you willing to lay down your own life to carry it on? And I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. Mark chapter 8, 31 to 38. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must of necessity suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and must be put to death and after three days he would rise from death. He was stating the matter plainly, not holding anything back. Then Peter took him aside and he began to reprimand him. But turning around with his back to Peter and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for your mind is not set on God's will or his values and his purposes, but on what pleases man. In other words, Peter wasn't seeing things with an eternal perspective, just his, an earthly perspective. Jesus called the crowds together with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, they must deny themselves, set aside their self-interest, and take up their cross, express a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. For whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses their life in this world for my sake and the gospel's sake, the good news of the kingdom, they'll save their life from eternal separation from God. For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world with all the pleasures and forfeit their eternal soul? For what will a person give in exchange for their soul and eternal life in God's kingdom? For whoever is ashamed here and now of me, Jesus says, and my words, in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of them when he comes in glory, the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. Now, can you imagine <laughs> being one of the 12 sitting there? You've been with this guy for about three years and you've, you know, you've, kind of seen him deal with Pharisees and you've seen him do healings and you've, you, you've seen him provide food for 5,000 and 4,000 and 
you know, he helped Peter to walk on water and he calms the storm and you're probably all fired up and really excited about all this kingdom stuff. And then he's got you all in a circle and he says, well, I got to let you know that when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to die on a cross. That'll be the end. Um, now they thought that Jesus had come to usher in a restored kingdom. They believed he would free them from oppressive rule, from the Roman occupiers. Now they're thinking, what's this? What's this? We, we've just started this work. You just got us together. What's going on? They were probably thinking, too, that if he's the Christ, the Son of God, as he confesses, then why would he be rejected by religious leaders? Why, wouldn't they want, why would they want to crucify him? Didn't the Old Testament prophets promise that the Messiah would defeat all of our enemies and establish this glorious kingdom? What is this? You're going to die when we get to Jerusalem. That makes no sense. Probably why Peter responded the way he did. He was thinking with these eyes. He wasn't thinking with these eyes. And then what about take up your cross? What did that what did that really mean? What did Jesus really mean? And what didn't he mean when he said, take up your cross and follow me? You know, nowadays we look at the cross as a really beautiful symbol. A lot of them, let's wear them around our necks. They have little jewels in them. And, you know, a lot of times we don't even know the story behind it, but we wear them and they're pretty. And sometimes we have them hanging in our houses and they usually are kind of a sign of peace and grace and love. Um, but that is not what it was at the time of Jesus. So when Jesus was asking those disciples, are you willing to take up your cross and follow me? It was a whole other ball of wax. So when Jesus carried his cross up to Golgotha to be crucified, no one was thinking those nice, warm, fuzzy thoughts about the cross. <clears throat> You're going to see a picture on the screen. That's really kind of an upsetting picture when you see it. So think about being asked if you're willing to take up your cross and follow Jesus while you're looking at the picture that's on the screen. Now, every day, as I've mentioned before, you'd go into work or you'd go into the town and you would see a row of people hanging on crosses. It wasn't an uncommon thing to see. So imagine you walking into town and you're seeing all these people hanging on crosses, suffering on crosses. And Jesus says, how about you? How about you? Are you willing? Are you, are you willing to are you willing to follow me? Are you so willing to follow me? And do you believe in this kingdom so much that you are willing to be like one of those guys up there? I, I would have really questioned myself. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that would have been hard for me. We know that the Romans forced convicted criminals to carry their own cross to the place of crucifixion. And we know that bearing a cross meant carrying their own execution device while being ridiculed, mocked, and spit on along the way. So when Jesus was asking the disciples, are you willing to take up your cross? That meant being willing to die in order to follow him. That's called dying to self. It's called absolute surrender. Have you ever believed in something so much that you would be willing to die for it? Have you ever had such a deep faith and believed so much in God's kingdom work and in his people that you'd be willing to lay down your life for it? Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What might that mean? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing some of your friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means being alienated from your family? 
Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your reputation? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? Or as silly as it sounds, are you willing to give up your Sunday afternoon? A Sunday afternoon that you plan to go to the beach and have a great time, got your picnic basket all ready to go, and you see the older lady next door to you in her yard crying because she just lost her husband, and she waves you on like this. Can you come and spend a few minutes with me? Are you willing to lay down your life for a neighbor or a friend? Are you willing to cook a meal for a neighbor even when you've had a crazy week? Are you willing? You know, Jesus isn't saying all these things are going to happen in your life if you choose to follow him, although in some countries people do lose their life for the sake of the gospel. People do lose their families, they lose their friends. Um, if you are a person from a different faith background who is really opposed to Christianity or any other faith background and you go home and you say, I've decided to follow Jesus, if you're not stoned to death or killed, you're certainly excommunicated and you're banished from your family. That's happening in places. In other countries, people who say yes to following Jesus Jesus and yes to living a kingdom life and living by God's kingdom rule and other countries people are, be, are, are dying. We don't think of it much here in America because we're so fortunate. Here we have the full freedom to live a kingdom life and oftentimes we don't. And here in other countries, you have people who are literally dying because they want to continue to say yes to the ways. And you know, the ways of Jesus are so good. They're so loving. They're all about community. They're about taking care of one another. When Jesus is asking us today, are you willing to take up your cross? Jesus is asking us, are you willing to be a kingdom keeper? Are you willing to let me transform your heart? Are you willing to be used for this heavenly kingdom work? Do you believe in the kingdom so much that you're willing to take up your cross and follow me to make it happen? Friends, I'm telling you the truth as sure as I'm standing here. If each human being on this planet. All right, I'll just go for Infredonia Buffalo on the southern tier. If each one of us truly said yes to being a kingdom follower of Jesus, that means following the ways of Jesus. You can even just start with the Ten Commandments. Okay, start with the first two. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Honest to goodness people, this world would change. We would literally change the world. Our earth could look more like the heavenlies if we choose to be the people in which the heavenly realm works through. Does that make sense? Father, that is my hope for each one of us. My hope is that each one of us will believe that you exist will believe that your kingdom truly exists and believe that we have the power to make the change because when you transform our hearts and you move into us, Lord, we become less selfish, selfish and we become more aware of others. Father, give us those hearts that move outside of ourselves. Give us those kingdom hearts. Give us, gosh, Jesus, just help us to finally make that leap of faith and live the life that you're calling us to live. I know we could change the world as we know it. Lord, we just ask this. We ask you to be with us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, if you have an interest in knowing more about Jesus, if you have an interest in knowing more about what that kingdom life can look like, if you want to be a part of something really good, reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm I'm happy to be present for you in any way you need me to be present. I'm telling you that making that decision will not only transform your life, but it will transform the lives around you. You know, finding your place in this world, feeling accepted, feeling loved, knowing that God loves you, and loving your neighbor as yourself is a really beautiful thing. So I'd like to just invite you to know that I'm available anytime you need anything or have any questions. Happy Sunday, and have a good week. Was that an okay message?